Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Lair Drop Podcast. Today I'm super excited to have Adam Robinson from rb2b and retention.com join us. Um, I actually met Adam, I think we met in person back at the Golden Hour Conference in New York. Probably yeah. Ago. Yep. And um, I think I learned that Adam lived in New York for, for the longest time before he moved out to, to Texas to Austin. Um, so fun, fun fact, just like learning more about people behind the LinkedIn curtain. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, it's, it's been good. Like, um, um, I'm excited about what Adam has been doing on LinkedIn over the past uh, couple of months. A lot of the stuff that he talks about really resonates, uh, with me and how we think go to market is really changing. Um, things around social selling things about execs and sellers really thinking about bringing customers to them. Um, so excited to dive deeper into that. So Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Parthi. Absolutely. Um, I think a couple of weeks ago, I, I saw uh, Santosh and or you, one of you guys, you spoke about how the future, uh, the future BDR um, or sales rep looks a little like a content marketer. Um, do you want to expand on that? Yeah. So I'm not sure. So like at the time I was making the argument that like uh, a sales team would be like a team of YouTubers. And I've thought a lot more about that and I still think it's a possibility. And I still think that, uh, organic social content creation, it will be it like, like, I, I think in 2024 today, it is like a 100 X for people who can create great social con organic social content versus those who cannot. And I'll go into the reasons why, but it, it, so, so it's like, but I'm just not sure that it will be like an in-house studio because the more I think about it, it just, there's just a lot of complexities with that. You, you know, it's like, it, and I think the alternative is just like the, the, the influencer is its own business and it's, you know, maybe you're, there's like exclusivity licenses and stuff like that. And it's, I just don't, you know, I just, it, it just seems like too much of a reach right now for, for 2030. But uh, I, I do want to like go into this. Um, it's like kind of a, a so one, one of my LinkedIn community members sent me this book, Day Trading Attention. And it's the Gary V book, right? And the first 10 pages, I was like, wow, he's saying things that I've been thinking and feeling. Uh, but of course, Gary V can articulate it so much better because he's Gary V. And the rest of the book, I didn't really think was like that worth it just with what I have going on. But like the first 10 pages were spot on. So I have been feeling this thing where I get served non thought leadership ads on LinkedIn. And it's from like Timia Capital. It's like five chubby guys in yarmulkes. A picture of them, right? Like, let me tell you how much I don't care about that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, uh, uh, like, I just don't care. Or like, Rippling sends a carousel in of businesses that are using Rippling in Austin. J just cards, you know, like, let me tell you how much I don't care, right? Like, but I do care a lot about, you know, uh, Sam Jacobs's take on articulating so clearly the mistake that I made as a CEO in 2023 of just like modeling out, you know, linear sort of like performance from increasing the size of my team and then like celebrating before it even started. And then I build the team out and it blows up my face and you know, the output's the same as before I hired the people, right? Like, uh, so the amount of focus that I give Sam Jacobs when I'm reading that, that post that lands and resonates, <laughs> like, I don't know how many times the amount of focus it is, that I give the Timmy, Timmy capital guys, but it's, it is, it is a massive amount more. And then over time, if you keep reading stuff like that out of someone or seeing it on video is even more powerful. Like this magic thing happens that like happened with the Kardashians that like happened with Hormozy that happens with all the, it's the reason why influences are a thing. It's like this niche, it's the democratization of fame, right? It's the democratization of parasocial relationships. I, my aim in all of this stuff is actually to just try to make people feel like they know me like a very close friend. So 
like they're on this journey with me. They know how I talk. They know how I, you know, my facial expressions and all that. Um, because the, like there's just, I mean, there's a reason why the Kardashian girls can like sell lipstick and be billionaires or whatever. It doesn't matter what they have. It's like, once you trust someone at that level, I mean, it's fairly basic marketing, right? Like, and, and my whole point is like, there's just no way off of any type of brand account or through any type of traditional paid ad that you can achieve that. So there's two parts of this thing that, that Gary Vaynerchuk brings up. Number one, which doesn't apply to LinkedIn so much, but like, I think it's sort of drifting that way, um, is ever since TikTok, algorithms are skewing towards interest rather than distributing content based on social connections exclusively. So pre TikTok, if you had millions of followers, people would see your stuff no matter how good it was. TikTok comes along, you could basically have zero followers. And if you produced really great stuff, it would get eyeballs. So that changed the dynamic completely. And then, you know, we're kind of at the point in America, at least where like social media time is sort of saturated and the platforms are competing with each other. And then how are you going to compete? Of course, you're going to try to serve more interesting content to people, which is what reels and shorts and like all that stuff is about. So that does this amazing, crazy thing that the thought leadership ad on LinkedIn also does, right? It gives you immediate feedback on if you created a banging post or a banging piece of content. And then when you know that it is amazing, you can then put ad dollars behind it and not before. So, so, so it's like, if you can create great organic content, his point is, this isn't completely true for LinkedIn, but like with the other platforms, you effectively have unlimited distribution. If you can't create a, or amazing organic content, then you're like <laughs> in this archaic paid ads world where customer acquisition cost is going up through the nose on you and you're screwed. So it's like, it's like this amazing le leveling of the playing field thing for those who can create organic social content and only those who can create organic social content. That is great. So a couple of things there. One, LinkedIn, to your point, hasn't become TikTok yet. We'll see what happens. Um, it is still fairly relationship and connection driven. The thing is, TikTok is like this consumer app. Like what, what yep. works there? It's just like sneakers and lipstick and makeup and celebrities. Now you're talking about like niche B2B software and pixel tracking. The TAM for number of eyeballs that want to get on there, it might be very va valuable eyeballs, is just a lot smaller. Um, and so if... I'm selling like high ACV uh, products, smaller TAM, still a really great content. How should I think about um, creating that kind of content? How should I be thinking about doing that in my business? Well, in my opinion, if you're selling that kind of stuff, LinkedIn is the place. And there's a reason why people don't have 200 million LinkedIn followers, right? Like, but if you look, if you do it correctly, uh, and I want to qualify that statement after I say this, but, um, this guy, Peter Conforti did, and I'll send you a link to this so you can link to it and show he did an analysis of my audience. And there were a couple remarkable things. Number one, 75% of the people who engage with me are actually spot on dead middle ICP with, for the RBV audience, which is crazy. I mean, that, that is so shocking to me that like, that is what happened. Um, so in some way this is interest-based, right? Cause like, I didn't have those followers before Labor Day of last year. My, my follower account kind of took a year to get to 20,000. And then it jumped when I started writing to B2B SaaS companies, it jumped from 20 to 40 in a week. And then it's like gone to like, I don't know what it is, 85 now, something like that. So, um, LinkedIn is the place for sure. It's just a matter of how you go about doing it. Um, now, before September, my other company, retention.com, we sell the e-commerce stores. A year before, so September 2022 or October 2022, I started on this journey. Um, I started with LinkedIn because the the e-com guys were on Twitter, but like the creator versus active user balance is like so much better on LinkedIn and a bunch of people in the ecosystem are on LinkedIn. So the idea was like, get 10, 20,000 followers and figure out how to tweet. So like, um, 
I was kind of like in the process of all that, trying to figure out how to tweet when I pivoted the content to B2B and it was just like, bam. And then like, it was like, oh, we should build a product. And like, here I am. Like, I don't even deal with that business anymore. I handed it off. So why I believe this is working so well for me is, um, so I am basically in many ways, and this is kind of taking from Rus Russell Brunson a little bit, like his language, uh, not only am I my ICP, I believe that I'm like where I am in my career being like a bootstrapped 22 million ARR founder who is also launching a new startup that like just went from zero to one in 15 weeks and like telling everyone every step of the way. Um, for, mo for most of the people that are in my target audience, I'm either ahead of them if they're founders and they're like, they look at that and like, that's amazing. Or if they're revenue leaders of companies that are way ahead of me, they actually want to do what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, like if you're a high level market CMO of like a whatever, it's like you actually want to be a bootstrap founder of a scaling SaaS, right? Like that is, so Russell, Russell said, he's like the perfect situation for this, whatever you want to call it, right? Like I, I, I think now, and this is a recent revelation for me, I think what I'm doing is actually just edutainment. And it's like, how do you grow the edutainment brand within LinkedIn and other channels that will work for you? But like, um, the perfect scenario for edutainment is when you're kind of like the ideal, the idealized version of your product uh, of your prospects, because then you can teach, you can show them what you're doing. And they will literally do every single thing that you're doing. So I have that incredible good fortune. I thought it was but before thinking about this through the Russell Brunson lens, I was just like, it's because I am my ICP and my ICP is on LinkedIn. But I don't think that's exactly right. Because Max is a great example from Warmly. He's trying to do a very similar thing. But he's only gotten one startup to 1 million. So who gives a sh you know, it's like, I love Max. I love what he's putting out, but it's like, it just doesn't have the same credibility, you know? So, um, so yeah, that doesn't mean that it's not possible to be credible. It just means that today where you are in your journey, it just might not land quite as well as my stuff does. But by the way, when I started a year and a half ago, I wasn't where I am today. So, so like it, it, and I was trying to talk to e-commerce stores and, and it just, it didn't, it just didn't land at all how it's landing now. And <clears throat> so, you know, I mean, I keep talking about like these big influencer guys cause I'm studying them a lot right now, but like at the end of Hermosi's second book, I like love this story that he tells. He's like, look in business, it's like you have this multi-sided die and everybody's got a different die. It's got a different amount of sides and the sides are either red or green and green means like you win. And when you roll green, a, a red side turns green. But when you roll a red, a side doesn't turn green, but you can just roll again for free. Right? So I have now got to this point where it feels like I have a lot of green on my die, but that was not the case five years ago. I was stuck at 3 million ARR for four, for literally four years. And it was like a very brutal thing to endure. Um, so all that is to say is to answer your original question, like if you're selling something like that, LinkedIn is definitely the place to be. You definitely should be creating thought leadership content in some way, right? It could either be you or, you know, I don't, you know, this, I don't know if there's a view like my LinkedIn guy thinks that there's like a really underpriced sales influencer voice out there that like no one has like really harnessed and aggregated to like orchestrate something really beautiful with. Um, I, I want to try to do something like that. But like then we got kind of distracted because Legion agencies are like so much better for us in that regard. And it's less expensive and all that stuff. Um, so but but that's a great example. It's like clay doesn't have me but they have clay creators and 100 percent, you know it's like basically you know seo like similar tech and whatever seo for them and this clay creator thing are like they're two main drivers of of pipeline um so so yeah 
I keep saying this. If you're selling something like you're describing, LinkedIn is a place. It's just situational. And and I would, I mean, look, I just am benefiting from it so much. Like, regardless of where you are, you will become more credible as your career advances and your and your journey becomes, you know, bigger and more interesting. But like, there is no downside to starting and mastering the craft because you want to be ready, you know, for the big time when when basically the opportunity presents itself. I mean, that's my opinion. It's just so it's like, if everything lines up, it's the most efficient thing that could possibly exist. When everything's lined up, you have to have the skills to be able to do it. The way you get the skills is starting today. <laughs> you know, that's kind of like how I think about it. <clears throat> okay. So how about like, let's say you're talking, you, you talk to all these people who are following you, right? These people who are um, buying our, our B2B today, um, in some ways, aspirationally, they want to learn from you. They want to be more like you. Um, how can they in practice, and, and you just mentioned it looks different for every type of company, right? You know, you need to be producing something. Who produces produces it is different, like Clipper Plates, the creators, for your business, it's it's yourself. Um, what is your advice to one of your customers right now in terms of how you how they should like think about like step by step operationalizing this um, for their their business today? Uh, so R B to B itself, you're talking about. Uh, like one of your customers, like people are buying, they're like, oh yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. How, how do I, how do I use my website in the first place? Right. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so the people who end up paying, it's not that they have that completely nailed, but they've got that problem solved to some extent, because if you don't have any traffic, we're not resolving any leads and like you use it yeah. and you're just like, there's no way I'm paying, you know, even $99 for this thing is too much. Um, so if you have traffic, then I just think there's one choice. It's like, do I automate with like clay and smart lead or something like that? Or, you know, if you have people doing any type of outbound, then all you really need to do is filter the leads down to the ideal customer profile in some way, either manually or maybe with clay or like we're building a filter right now and then do whatever type of outreach you were doing before. Um, that didn't really answer your question. I think your question's more like, it's more like, what do I do? Yeah. How do you get, how, how, how do you get traffic in the first place? Are, yeah. I don't scale, but I want, yeah. I want that volume. I kind of want to replicate what you're doing. Like what, what should, what should we be doing? Yeah. So, been, but like, so what do they really do? Yeah. So like, I, 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 I have arrived somehow kind of, you know, we didn't like really go in deeply to like really why I think my content works so well, but like, for all of the reasons that my content works so well in this audience, um, I have arrived in this position where I actually think I have the most engaged, most valuable audience in B2B sales, MarTech, SaaS, especially for a CEO. So my whole thing was like, in that position, what do you do, right? So it's like, this is a weird analogy, but it's like a lot different to be uh, you know, put as president of the U S or like president of Russia, right? Like it, you just are, are, you have such a different circumstance that, you know, but like for my circumstance, it's like, I have this audience now and like, I'm in this weird position where I actually have a bigger audience than almost all of the podcasts in the space. And from my past experience, so similar to retention.com, there's a low penetration of this idea in implementation of person level website visitor identity. Like Max was out there selling it, but like he's got 1 million error. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not like, it has not made its way into this world. So what I learned from retention.com was in a low penetration game, it's an awareness game and what worked for us over there was just getting in front of people who had audiences of big Shopify stores. However, however we could either in person or over a, a, a lunch, uh, lunch online didn't even matter. Um, if we could just get a bunch of people in front of us and say what we did, like half of them would get on a demo, you know? So, you know, the digital equivalent of that is just like trying to get on, anyone in everyone's podcast who is doing anything related to the space. 
Now, most of it's actually inbound for me. Like we, when I run out of, of bookings, uh, I have my LinkedIn guys, like they have a list of podcasts, go try to prospect people to get on theirs. Um, but, uh, I just say that it's part of what I want to do and like my calendar fills up. So I think that's a very unique situation. I don't think if anybody else posted, you know, I'm looking to get on podcasts to get like 10 bookings in the comments, you know, uh, but you, you know, you can hire lemon pie and they'll, you know, you pay them seven, eight grand a month and they will guarantee you, uh, like, I don't know. I think they guarantee you like 50 podcasts and they'll, they'll guarantee you like one a week or two a month or something like that, getting you on shows like this. Um, so it won't work quite as well as what I'm doing, but you can definitely approach with the same thing. Cause like my fundamental, you know, I had this, this thing that I talk about that happened to me last year where like, uh, I'm kind of inexperienced at growing sales teams. I was like, Oh, another thing we need to do in addition to generate awareness in general is just get an outbound, outbound BDR motion going predictable revenue style. So we had like two of them working and that worked. And then we hired eight more and then it was booking the same amount of demos as the two were. And I was like, why is that? And, you know, today in 2024, I think it's that demand, demand is ultimately created in situations like this, you know, like, uh, you plant the seed and then people start asking around and like, that's actually how it starts. I don't think it starts anymore with a BDR emailing someone being like, Hey, like who on your team handles, you know, site visitor identity or like whatever, right? <laughs> like, like that might've used to have worked, but like, it's just so played out now that, that like, there's no way. So, uh, but like you need these people to actually capture the demand better than I think a machine does at this point. But I think that's what they're doing ultimately. Right. And, you know, demand for what we're doing, it's created through this like amazing organic content machine that exists in the world. Uh, again, it's working incredibly well for me. It will work f to varying degrees. If you're selling the kind of stuff you're talking about, it's just a matter of how you go about doing it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, any, any way I think that Chris Walker calls it dark social, you know, six cents calls it the dark funnel. It's like, what can you do to actually be at a point? Like Google is not a source of demand. Google is like someone heard about you somewhere else. And then they came to Google and they typed your brand in. Right. So, um, you know, I, I'm in this unique position to where I don't have to pay to get on podcasts in like. Uh, I have a lot of tailwind, but I think the same ideas still apply. It's like, how are you going to get in front of other people's audiences, <laughs> right? Like retention.com, what we have to do is a fucking pain in the ass. Now it's like, we have a target list of 1400 stores because our penetration of that market has gone up substantially in the last two years. It's like a lot of them have gone through the system. Uh, so it is a 100% field sales motion, we have to find people in the real world who know people on this list and throw a good enough owned event that people who won't like there's there's a crew who just goes to dinners, they're underpaid, and they're, they're single, and they'll just go to any dinner. Like, DTC people would come to our dinner for B2B if we invited them. That, that's just like one crew who goes to dinners. How do you get someone out who's got two kids? And, you know, so like they're doing stuff like renting a mansion in Malibu and having like a full on spa day for people or like, you know, a, a renting out basketball city in New York and like having three New York Knicks give basketball camps for like, you know, kids or whatever. Right. So that kind of sales is never going to get old or it's never going away. Um, you know, the digital equivalent of that is, which is this, in my opinion, it's like much more effective. So long as there, there's all sorts of winner take all stuff with this content too. It's like, uh, you know, I, I don't know that I'm there yet, but like, if you interviewed Gary V people would listen to it just because Gary V was on it, <laughs> you know? So it not only is like it easy for Gary V to get on any podcast, people are actively searching for his voice too. So right. anyway, but, right. but yeah, to wrap all that up, 
since I'm, I got some heat for saying this the other day, but like, since I'm the CEO and I don't actually have to measure any of my activity and I really have this intuition that this is how demand is created. And I have this very unique opportunity to like, just try to saturate the space, you know, on these like, uh, dark social channels is what I'm trying to do. The interesting thing is you literally can't like, I'll never be able to like draw a line from this or the other three podcasts I'm on today to any signups or any, anything, <laughs> you know, like maybe I could connect the six cents episode to like signups popping or like when that guy Clark Barron called me out for being a scumbag because of privacy, like we got a spike that week, nothing else I can tie back to anything, but my, but it's like, I just think about it this way. It's like, if 10 people are listening to this, there's no way that at least a few of them aren't like, oh, well, I like what he has to say. I'm going to go check him out on LinkedIn and like, see what he does. And like with the, with the level of penetration that we have in the market, that's enough. It's like, all you have to do is hit our homepage and read the headline person level website visitor identity. And you'll immediately know whether or not you're interested and it's free. So, <laughs> right. So like, that's like kind of the whole, that's that my approach for this moment and go to market given where I am. Right. It right. wouldn't have been that way two years ago, you know, but, but two years ago I hired lemon pie. <laughs> I try to do, you know what I mean? So anyway. And so for a lot of your customers, let's say they are in a position where they have a SDR is they're trying to do a lot of outbound, but to your point, it's not doing, it's not incrementally working more than when they had two BDRs. Um, I guess your advice to them is just like, Hey, like at least start with thought leadership. Um, at least if you're in B2B, probably LinkedIn, first place to start. Uh, and by the way, I would advocate with high, I would advocate for hiring a ghostwriter originally mm -hmm. and just watching, okay. like letting them share ideas with you about like ideas that might resonate and then watching yeah. them write. And then you'll either say, I don't like this at all, which I think is not that common. Or it's like, what I hear a lot is like, I don't know exactly what this is doing for me, but it's doing something. And like what's happening is you're, be, you're becoming alive on this platform that you weren't alive on and you'll start getting weird inbound for stuff that like, isn't necessarily just demos, right? Like it's people saying they want to work for you or like investors coming in and talking to you or like, you know, partnership stuff. It gives you like big credibility with your vendors to start posting thought leadership. So that's what I would do. Uh, it's just a matter of who. And then like, you know, the, 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 the dream situation is like what happened to me. It's like, your CEO sort of, I, I started with a ghostwriter, like your CEO sees what's happening. And even though it's not doing what it's supposed to do, understands the potential of nailing it. And like gets committed to going down this road of just banging their head against the wall until it's like fire, right? Because then, then you're really winning, you know? You, you think the CEO needs to do it or could you get anybody like your VP of sales, like other people to do it at the company too? Uh, I think the VP of sales would likely pull a different audience because it's like, but it depends on what you're selling. I mean, if you're selling a tool that a VP sales is buying or, or, or a champion of within the organization, then maybe he's the perfect guy. But, um, I, I, I think that the CEO is the most credible, Gotcha. you know, yeah. uh, but uh, yeah. Um, but so if you I, I don't think it's a require, I don't think it's a requirement, but I think it's yeah. like, it, it, it just, there's magic around it. If you can make right. that happen. Right. And if I sold to like banks or something like that, should I just go hire somebody who used to be in that position of bank and try to build my, build that person up within the company? Or what would you s say to somebody like that? Like we're talking so, about like go to architects, everything. Yeah. So, house. so like if you sell to banks, I may not make the, I, I don't think that I would make the investment that I have made in LinkedIn as a platform because I don't think that they're, on LinkedIn in the way that sales and marketers and recruiters are. Um, I, I just don't know how, how tech sold into that space. I have no idea, but like, it's kind of a marketing exercise. Like, like, like uh, so the reason we don't make a lot of social content for the e-commerce stores, like rather than trying, rather than being like, Oh, like 
Diana, instead of working on retention.com's operations, try to crack D2C Twitter, right? The reason we haven't decided to do that is because it's like the author platform audience fit isn't really there. It's like, why is somebody going to read her tweets about D2C rather than Nick Shackelford, who's literally starting a brand, owns an agency, has been tweeting about D2C for four years and has in a super credible or like Nick Sharma, who's like got 250,000 followers and like this dope ass podcast with Moyes and whatever. So it, it thought leadership is like unbelievably effective when everything is lined up. I think it's important for other reasons also, which would be valuable if you're selling to banks, like recruiting, I think like your CEO posting thought leadership is incredibly important. Recruiting is like super important in what you're doing and like whatever investors also super important. Like if you can like, cause, cause there's, there's more than just business that makes a company work. Right. So thought leadership allows people to kind of like inbound sell themselves on everything that you're doing. So while for me, it's driving this incredibly efficient, actual business growth for this person who sells to banks. I mean, you, you might be able to use your ghostwriter for that indefinitely, and it might really help you, you know, you may not have a hundred thousand followers, but like you probably still will have important hires checking out what you have to say and seeing if they align on, on values and stuff like that. So, so yeah, that's, that's my take on that. Gotcha. No, that's fascinating. It all really comes down to whether you have that lived experience that matters to the ICP um, you're selling to. And the, the the interesting thing or the reality here is that there are a lot of like the vast majority of businesses probably don't have that in-house, right? Like if you're thinking about like 20 something year old starting companies, like what historical experience are they really leaning on? Um, but they need to go to market in some way. Yeah, um, I think they can start and this is where maybe like build in public, you just share what you're learning day to day from your customers who actually have more experience from you. And you're essentially being, I mean, like a parrot um, where, hey, I'm having interesting conversations with these hundreds of people who you respect. Um, and I'm just putting their stuff out into the world as opposed to yes. like leaning on my own experience, which is like basically nothing. And, and that is, so like social content is just like any other content. There's yeah. a hook, there's, the body and there's a clothes and the most important thing's a hook. It's like, you know, in, in, uh, print, they say you should spend 50% of your time on the headline or the hook. Uh, uh, we, we don't, but, um, one of the best hooks for me is I've spoken to 40 founders the last two, you know, whatever. And, and it's got nothing to do like, and another thing about LinkedIn, since we're kind of talking about this is, uh, Alec always says you, you have to like, so the other interesting thing about this audience analysis that this dude, Peter Conforti did is over 20 posts, like post to post 80% of the audience is unique. Isn't that crazy? So I posted, uh, I had them do this analysis again, um, like two weeks ago when I did a pricing post and then four days later I did another pricing post because like. We changed our pricing and then literally the first day I had four people come in. I'm like, this is wrong. Like the above 500 prices are all fucking wrong. So uh, we changed it again immediately. And like, we try to do the work in public stuff quick. So posted it. And I actually want to share this because it's, it's so wild. Um, I have a Venn diagram of it. So pricing post to pricing post screen. Uh, so pricing post to pricing post, there was, I don't know what that is like 15% overlap between the two posts. I would have thought, so I thought that the reason in Conforti's analysis that there was such little overlap is because I vary between topics so much. There's like a work in public, then there's a, there's like post about ABM and then there's posts about predictable revenue model being dead. And there's post about, you know, sort of, uh, you know, I'll do monthly updates or I'll do just like random, you know, random shit, like reading my glass door reviews online, 
I thought that the, the, the variation between the posts was responsible for the variant audiences. But if I posted two in a row about almost an identical topic, it would be these people who were in my audience that engaged with that topic. That is not the case, which is fascinating. So to Alex's point, you have to treat this platform as though it is a brand new set of eyeballs every time you post. So you, the hook has to have as much credibility building as humanly possible. I drop revenue numbers a lot because I have revenue numbers. If you don't have revenue numbers, then you got to drop stuff like you're saying, right? Which is highly credible credibility building. Like the fact that you are talking to people who are admired by others is admirable, right? And then to your point, I do think working in public is a great way to start. Um, people are worried about competitors. Don't be, everyone's going to copy you anyway. Like <laughs> you working in public is not going to accelerate that one bit. What it might do is it might increase your brand awareness to whoever, right? Uh, whatever parties you're trying to like get interested in you. Um, and another thing, like I said before, it's like, the story is not that interesting, right? When you're starting out, it gets the, 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 the level of interest in your story compounds as you grow, right? Because of where you're at and like the number of people working in public who are just starting out is enormous. The number of people working in public above 20 million ARR is one, right. this guy, right? So it's a pyramid. So the longer you can continue to do that, the less competition you have with people at your level, right? Awesome. Well, Adam, this has been an amazing podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to just share. But thanks for sharing like your, like how LinkedIn's been working for you, who it works for, um, some insights on that stuff. But uh, this was this was fantastic and really love having you on, on the Letter Drop podcast today. Thank you for having me. It's good chat.